for those who don't know me, I'm Pat Price, I'm chairing today. And so welcome everybody back from Christmas. We gave at least a hello. We had a little break over Christmas and New Year. So um, welcome everybody back and I hope you're all well and coped. I know we've got all our COVID surges around the, the world and a few vaccine stresses, whatever. But I was just thinking, we started this last April. Remember on the day Wuhan came out of lockdown the first time? And that's 10 months. And you think what's happened in that time, really amazing. Um, so I hope we are regrouping because we missed a week and um, apologies for the Australians who actually it's two o'clock in the morning for them. We've changed our time today, of course, partly because um, Ben is from the West Coast, but we are recording this for the Australians because it's a little bit late. But hopefully this has uh, moved it around a bit. So I, I wanted to do what we wanted to do today was give us some extra impetus now with the global coalition. So just to update you from last time, we prepared the white paper on the hypofractionation that's up on the website. And also we've put, we're in the middle of an editorial for the Red Journal. So that hopefully will be submitted in the next few weeks. And that's about the global coalition. So that's been great. So today, what we wanted to talk about in two sections, the second section, we're going to talk about the strategy that we're developing with the Global Coalition. I know you've all had some inputs into that and really rethinking now where our role is for, for the radiotherapy globally, um, now rebuilding after, the, uh, after COVID in terms of the opportunities, the priority, access and all the digital and technology uh, advances and also we'll explain a new communication tool we'll have to make it easier for us to talk to each other. Um, but the, the main meeting today we wanted to go um, for a talk really about developing the concept of the disruptive technologies we can have in radiotherapy and really talking about where the digital revolution thinks, sits with radiotherapy and what are the opportunities. And over the next few meetings, we wanted to be discussing IT, use of data, technology, the role for the future, and then hopefully to develop a, a white paper over these next few months about what is our thinking globally about where do all these technologies and how we can really take radiotherapy to the next level. And that might be involving people outside the field or whatever, where are we now? So um, I hope today's the title has been very attractive because so a really pleasure to introduce Bell Nems, who's up in my top left hand corner, who is the founder and director of ProNow, and Ben Lee, who's in the middle of my screen here, who's the, um, the director and founder of Regus Cancer Centre and also at UCSF today. So they're going to talk to us about the cloud and how it can make us um, help us improve access to radiotherapy. As we spoke before, ultimately my aim is that we can treat our patients on a mobile phone. So <laughs> how are we going to get there? So perhaps Ben and Ben, if we um, hand this over to you for, for some talking and then we'll take questions on the end and then Birgit's going to talk to us about strategy. So Ben and Ben, over to you. That sounds great. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Well, good morning or good evening or good afternoon from wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be here. My name's Ben Nelms. I'm going to do the first kind of rapid fire introduction to prono and think of that like the how the how that you get to put the what with what do you do with things uh that like what we built and then the second part of the presentation is dr ben lee and we'll trade the screen over to him and he'll specifically talk about some of the pretty amazing how uh, what that he's been doing over the past couple years so really quickly i'm just going to go through a few slides but i want you to think about some things this is what i've been thinking about for a couple decades really i had this concept over 20 years ago about centralizing data in radiation therapy, but this was before the cloud existed. So we tried to solve it a long time ago with server farms, et cetera, and it was just really expensive and you had to have everyone wired together. Well, when the real cloud, of course, is driving the world, I thought now is the time. So three questions to think about is first is, where are your data? Um, second question, how do you get to those data? How do you interact to them to view them, manipulate them, create new? or edit? And then the third question is, what can you learn from your data? So these are the questions we saw, set off with, with Prono. We were found, what we founded uh, in the early 2016, and we really have built a system from the ground up uh, for radiation therapy, which is one of the data-wise, It's it may be the most complex medicine modality in the world. 
radiation therapy because of the different data structures. It's not just images. It's the contours you're creating on them, the anatomy volumes, the uh, plant, the radiation plans, both brachytherapy and external beam, the doses you calculate, and then all the different metric constructs like DVHs, et cetera. It's very complex, much more complex than, than anything like surgery, et cetera. So if you think about connecting on the cloud, you've solved where are your data. You've also solved how do you access to your data because you can build a client. And in fact, we've built the client so you don't, don't need any special hardware. You can log in from anywhere, um, Macintosh, Windows, et cetera, because we realize people aren't always gonna be at the same site and teams are not just over a network now, they're really global or they should be global. And then what we did, we build in from the ground up is how do you learn from your data? So it's not just, hey, I want to go and do some tasks. It's looking at your history and saying, what can we learn from that? And so <clears throat> just really quick, it's kind of a boring slide, but it's worth doing. This is like the lifespan of data on the cloud. It's not much different than how you manage data now, other than you now have access to it from anywhere. So it's the same data structures, images, CT, MR, PET, et cetera. You've got your DICOM RT structures, plan, and dose. And then you get those on the cloud somehow. The way we do that is via the conventional ways. We have local DICOM services that can be listening for data that you're going to send up. And instead of shuttling it off to another medical device, we put it on the cloud for you. You can also do batch uploads, manual uploads. We are now configuring for big um, uh, clinical trials, multi-institutional. We are putting in an auto anonymization feature that happens locally. But when you go on the cloud, one of the big questions is security, security. It's actually quite beautiful. We encrypt before it leaves. So we're encrypting the data, meaning if it goes and lives on the cloud, the cloud is just a bunch of servers all over the place. Uh, if someone were to walk in and walk out with all the servers that were housing your data, they couldn't do anything with it because it's all encrypted. It doesn't live there as DICOM files. What it means now is that with your, your applications, you can now interact directly. You log in, you have all the terabytes of data they access to. You've got a team that is now connected just with internet connections. And then if you ever need the data locally, you just send it back to your local system. So Prono, we started off with really with what I call scientific philanthropy. I had been involved in a lot of plan studies and contouring studies in my in my pre-PRONO days. And we developed PRONO systems. And really by now we have over 9,000 international users, mostly driven by these free public international studies we've done. The first thing we did was we were focusing on the, the variation in treatment planning, which is actually vast. The technology as of yet does not determine how good your treatment plans are. It's the humans running the technology and that even goes for auto planning. So auto planning has not quite arrived that you can just turn it on and have it be uh, the, the perfect plan. It's still very much driven by the pilot. So we based these quality systems on the plan to study act. In our particular case, you build a library of standards then you create online tools to do exercises. The do part is that people can log in and do the exercise. We actually created both planning and contouring because those are two high variation pieces where the actual individual and their skills and their experience and their training determines the output of their work. Then you get to see, how did I do? How did I do not only versus uh, uh, in an absolute way, what's my score, but how did I do versus a popu anonymous population of my peers? And then you get to act. Where are, the, where are the areas of need? What modalities are performing better than others, et cetera? So when we did this for treatment planning, we specifically made a system. It's, it exists today. You can create a free account and go uh, check it out where you can go and do all any number of treatment plans. The, the anatomy are provided, the actual scorecard is provided. So when you've generated your plan, you just upload the DICOM, you get your scorecard. And then usually when we're running an open study, we'll leave the population results blind to the population. And then when we open the study up, we'll show all the different population analytics. So you can see where was your score relative to others using your same treatment planning system, your modality uh, overall. And then you get to act on that what you thought might have been the best possible plan, you may have a rude awakening, or you may not know you are one of the best treatment planners in the world. And we have had a lot of fun with this and it's done a lot of good. Um, the other thing that, that we focused on with these quality systems is contouring. So we actually have a system where you can log on, choose from a library of contours, draw it, 
see how you did versus whatever physician team of experts provided the standard and then see how you did versus the uh, population and also do things like consensus maps and you get to keep practicing. So we're pretty amazed to see the variation when people try for the first time. Um, but then as they practice, you get to see the, 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 the performance tighten up. So those are the quality systems, but really all along we were building the architecture for this cloud-based RTPAC system. And when you think about this, you got to think you log in. There's two different ways you can see things in Prono. One is I'm looking at an individual patient's data. So you get to dive into the images, the structures, the plan, the dose. You get to edit structures. You get to uh, assess plan quality. And you get to start accruing all your patients with these really high-performance navigation tools where, again, the data are stored on the cloud so you can access it from anywhere and you can share it across any, any number of colleagues. So things you can do, and I'll, I have to go through this quickly so we can start uh, uh, hand it off, but obviously along the, the timeline of radiation therapy planning, you, it's easy to do image view, contouring, plan quality review. So really this becomes this universal architecture for where your data live, but you can use any planning system you want. You can use any dose calculation you want. You can use any delivery system you want. It's where those data are that matter. Um, so think of, I think of Linux, I call them photon printers. Treatment planning systems are plan makers. We need to start thinking about what things do what across the workflow and stop thinking so much about products, but more about applications as well. Let me just show you some of the tools we have. Here's a small cohort of patients where that scorecard, you now get to see it's a, di every, it's a distribution. So you see these box plots showing you across this population of patients treated the same way, how did they perform versus each other. You can start diving in and looking at variation. This is a lower left is what we call the population DVH. It's for a single organ. What's the variation of DVHs across all similar patients? You can interact with histograms. Click on a histogram and figure out which patients have a data point there or click on a patient and figure out where they are in the spectrum. Same with scatter plots because not you don't just want to study variation. You want to study correlation, hopefully finding some very useful and sometimes surprising predictive value of metrics. So ultimately you can be building these scatter plots and now your data are not just being stored, they are being used. And that's really kind of the, 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 the heart and soul of Prono. And I'll, this is my last slide before I hand it off. Now, not just for clinical usage and as your RT packs and archive, now you start thinking about, oh, wait a second. This can be used for an education, benchmarking across multiple institutions, not only within a network, across the world. So we have had a lot of groups start using this to do international training and just building anatomy atlases, building planning atlases, letting people upload case studies and then sharing those case studies with the world so that they can learn, they can sit at their computer, log in and start learning, even if they don't have the equipment yet uh, or they have the equipment and they don't know how to use it yet. They can start interactively learning because we're sharing. We're sharing the knowledge and we're sharing the expertise. Um, one last slide that just I'll throw, th throw we, we built in an API. So a lot of you people are gonna be hooked up with software engineers or research sites. Th we've put in an application programming interface so you can house your data on Prono and do a lot of, uh, of uh, research tools or other tools. And in fact, some of the tools that Ben Lee and Rayos Contra Cancer have been using, have been um, using a product, a, a third party application I wrote that just does some batch analyses. So that's a little bit on what we've built. That's the how you can do things. Let's talk about some of the things you can do, the what. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Ben Lee. And Noam, thank you so much. As usual, uh, your work is so impressive. And a little bit of the backstory. Um, when I was starting Rios Country Cancer, I uh, quickly became aware of Prono and saw everything that they could do. And I just thought it was incredible. Um, wasn't sure exactly when the right time to reach out to Ben Nelms was, but I think it was a, a little bit of a, uh, by chance, um, we shared the same name. I thought it was a sign. <laughs> and then the rest is kind of history. Um, he was, he was incredibly um, kind. Uh, he believed in, in my vision, even though at the time I was, I was young, I was a medical student, but he saw the potential of, of what this could be. 
taking his technology and, and putting a vision and mission behind it. So uh, with that, I'd like to start the second half of this presentation. Um, how can we take everything that Ben just sh showed us and put this to work to improve access to radiotherapy? So my name is Ben Lee, um, currently a resident physician at UCSF, and I founded Virus Country Cancer 2018. We're three years later, 2021, and if I understand correctly, all of us on this call are masters from different angles to the same problem. Some of us are in industry, some of us are in large international professional organizations, and some of us are key opinion leaders. And our groups all share similar incentives right now. We're all leaders capable of mobilizing our resources. So the question I wanna ask is, are we looking for the right solution? Are we waiting for the right moment? Or is the answer already in front of us? The problem I think we can solve is building better access to life-saving and life-changing radiotherapy in regions where current support and infrastructure are scarce. And right now, industries working, governments and other organizations are trying to help install new radiotherapy equipment. Countries and organizations are working to supply personnel and clinical staff. We have new technology up and coming to perform modern, high quality radiation treatments. We know this can help improve the efficiency, the productivity, and the throughput of these clinics. And measurable success and ongoing measurable improvements can help us get rising support. We have the Mary Curie legacy, which is showing the cost efficiency of radiotherapy. For every one euro of investment, the health system benefits five euros. And this is, this is just the beginning, I think, that we know that radiotherapy is an investment and will help create a world with less suffering. And I think that's why we're all here. But how do we get from here to here? I think this is where a lot of us are struggling. And today I wanna to propose how we can bridge this gap. So I propose a longitudinal peer-to-peer -peer support with expert radiation oncologists, medical physicists, radiation therapists from all areas of the world focused on clinic development that's comprehensive and relevant to the local clinic needs, that's implemented just in time with no bureaucracy or delays. Money is never a barrier and it's personalized to each center. And we have measurable results and a team to report the measures within one year. And we'll leverage the cloud-based collaboration. We'll have, the in we'll have the ability to integrate the cloud for engaging education, professional and practical training and measurable results in four key domains. I put contouring, treatment planning, machine QA and patient specific QA. I think these are all possible with the technology that Ben Elms has helped create. This is our opportunity to change the world with over 8,000 radiotherapy clinics and over 3,000 and growing in LMIC regions where now the world faces 70% of cancer cases. This is our target. Clinics in these developing settings that have the motivated staff and they either already have equipment or are planning to receive the equipment soon. And they just feel that they need more professional support than what's available to them locally. If we can reach 4,000 centers, accounting for the creation of new centers too, this would impact millions of cancer patient lives per year. It would save lives and make lives better. And each center, roughly five to 50 clinicians, one to eight linear accelerators, zero to one brachytherapy units. In my experience, the volume of patients treated ranges from 200 to 1500 per machine and uh, per brachytherapy unit, 50 to 1000. So doing some math, you see that this is approaching 10 million patients. And if we can empower local leaders, strong learners, and new teachers locally, then not only will we have helped patient lives, but we will have altered the landscape of radiation oncology. And taking this a step further, 
if we can inspire and engage a new generation of global oncology-minded young professionals, we will set the stage for a new landscape of cancer care. All of us here are kind of special. We've, we've found ourselves in this niche from our organizations. You know, we're the ones that gravitate towards this global oncology problem. Um, a lot of us are kind of mid or middle or later into our careers. Imagine if we were here from the start and we could build a career focused on addressing this issue. So how do we do all this? I think we need a vendor neutral nonprofit organization that's responsible for organizing all this robust education and training opportunities that responds to the needs that arise. Cloud-based activities and remote infrastructure will allow us to pool talented and motivated volunteers and connect them with talented and motivated clinics. Cloud-based software will allow us an opportunity to engage at a level never before seen in global health. And I think this will be a chance to flex radiation oncology's muscles. Clinics just need to say, I need help in X. Volunteers just need to say, I am skilled in X and am interested to get involved in global health and we rely on our global partners to help raise awareness. And then with almost no administrative burden on either side, professional efforts are synchronized and orchestrated in order to support any clinic in need in less than two months notice. This isn't just a dream, this is something that we've started to do. Um, I'll tell a little bit about my organization. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to me if this organization is what accomplishes the goal or if someone just copy pastes this and builds their own organization. Um, all we care about is the mission and achieving the outcomes. So I'm gonna to try to share as much as I can so that you can see how simple this is and how in front of our eyes we could make this happen. But our um, we work with um, existing radiotherapy clinics and we try to enable the resources that are already in place. That doesn't cost a lot of money. Our programs focus on education and training in areas where support is otherwise scarce for radiation oncology. And then in parallel, we have a lot of motivated people all starting to help in new ways as they become engaged. And what the organization does is we create, administer, and measure these longitudinal training programs. Each program has been developed by a lead educator and is supported by several other educators who teach sessions throughout this longitudinal program. Each session is bite-sized for the clinic so that it works for them. We found that one or two sessions per week um, is the right balance where it doesn't disrupt their clinic too much but at the same time gets very high engagement and people are staying from beginning to end of the calls. Um, in some areas of the world, even connecting at 10 or 11 p.m. at night. And our programs reach cohorts of clinics at a time who share a need for specific medical education and training. And we foster an intimate peer-to-peer -peer learning environment where discussion is encouraged among all clinics in real time. And I hope you all have the chance to see a session one day. But this is a way for everyone to join the mission, beginning with this two month pre-launch phase where we rec recruit the clinics who all share that common need, find the educators who can help fill that need. And then we perform our education and training program, which is almost like a college quarter course. Um, I don't, Kind of surprised it's actually turned out that robust, but um, we've, we've just tried to build based on what is needed. And um, pre-COVID, uh, we would complement this with on-site visit. During COVID, we're kind of just waiting to see how the dust settles. And afterwards, we have a sustained phase. And ultimately, our goal is to help these clinics train others. And I think that cloud-based collaboration should be a new standard for global health programs in the world. I have no doubt about that. 
And this is what a program may look like. How many of you can think of five or seven radiation oncologists or medical physicists who would like to help if someone told them, can you volunteer one hour of your time? And this is really an example where teamwork makes the dream work. This was our SBRTSRS training program for a clinic that had just upgraded to this technology. Didn't have any SBRT or SRS training programs available in their country. And they found that this was incredibly useful. Organization is really the key ingredient, not money. And here's an example of our brachytherapy curriculum. In our first six training program offerings, we've included this SBRT SRS, as I mentioned, our HDR brachytherapy, specifically focused on medical physicists, because that's actually where the gap was the greatest. IMRT for physicists and oncologists. IMRT for radiation therapists, head and neck contouring plan and evaluation. And then this one was ambitious, but transitioning from 2D to 3D. <laughs> and you can see the composition of each is multiple supporting educators and sessions. And actually lately our, these courses are, are pretty impressive. Um, so I, I wanna share a little bit about what the clinic experience is like, because I, I think their words will speak much louder than mine. It was an unforgettable experience and we're glad that now we are available to discuss SRS and SBRT with our team. Never doubt that we'll be waiting for participate in another course that you'll organize. And for RMRT for therapists, we haven't had any training on beating radiation technologists. The field is changing, immobilization, treatments for patients. So education like this is very helpful. And it's been a long time since we graduated. All the instruction on VMAT, image verification, et cetera, is helpful. Some topics are review and some are just great to have dedicated teaching for medical technologists. For our physicists, we implemented some of the QA protocols and are starting to make those strict. We're following each step of the way. We have also started to take advantage of the planning techniques that were shown. It has all been very helpful. The timing is perfect because we are just starting to use VMAT. This is the perfect scenario where you are giving them exactly what they want. And I think that's what we need to do. HDR brachytherapy, dear Ben and all the RCC staff, I hope this email will find you in the best health condition. We are well, I'm very pleased with the work done by RCC. It was very productive for us and we were able to gain a lot of confidence in developing high dose rate brachytherapy activities from implementing a new program to the best of symmetry planning techniques. The country, the hospital and radiotherapy services and professionals involved in this training program, we thank you with all our heart. We look forward to sharing all our future practices. So these programs are making a big difference. And I wanna highlight this one because this is the program where we use Prono the most. It's our head in that contouring and plan evaluation. And I, I think it's the most comprehensive contouring curriculum to date. Every, participant contoured an entire head in that case as part of the enrollment and also contoured an entire head in that case after the course. We're analyzing those results right now, but you can see some ways that we integrated PRONEF throughout the course to make it interactive. Here, um, different participants took a stab at all contouring the CTV. Here we had, um, an exercise on plan evaluation where we showed two different plans and we asked the audience to say which one they would use. And we had the dosimetrist present to discuss the pros and cons. And here we have the expert head and neck specialist here to show how he would contour. And this is something that you can't get in a research article or in a textbook. For most of the participants, this is their first time watching someone contour in front of them. And 
that knowledge is so precious to them. We're saving recordings and sending it to them because they ask us to. And we're trying to make these more widely available. For the 2D to 3D program, I wasn't sure exactly how successful we were going to be doing everything virtually. <laughs> There's just so many things to, to consider, but I think this quote says a lot. Even if we had years of experience with 3D, we learned a lot of new things and it has definitely changed my career. Just so you know, on the other side, this is a joy for educators to, to join. We've had 100% satisfaction, believing it's a meaningful experience in their interest and they would lead another session if asked. And they strongly recommend this to the peers to get involved in sessions. And this is a dose of reality for COVID. I guess you can read here. <laughs> but Rios is one of the light in the tunnel, people working together for better healthcare and education. In our first nine cohorts, we've worked with 76 centers and over 1,100 clinicians. You can see that we work with groups of clinics at a time within the same region. That way there's time zone concordance. And uh, we started in Latin America, but now have programs in the Middle East, in Africa, and also in Asia. And we need to go the next step. We are committed to empowering clinics to become future trainers. So every new iteration of training incorporates alumni participants as educators. This is one of our core values. And we're assembling practical YouTube playlists for these learners. We're sharing supplementary materials that complement the lecture slides. And we're really trying to do our best to empower the local resources. We now have over 900 subscribers on our fresh YouTube channel. <laughs> and I think most of these are LMIC providers. And most importantly, we're building relationships. We're helping each other engage and connect. And we're structuring opportunities for ongoing connection and support joining and leveraging what really is a worldwide effort. And we're trying to make every clinic that we work with aware of the resources that could most help them. And they build trust and confidence in us as we work with them over time and they start to use these resources. So this is the roadmap I propose with no additional support 3x growth per year. This past year we reached 57 clinics. I think this year will be around 150 and 2022 about 400 and we'll use existing training programs. We don't need to reinvent the wheel but there may be less one-on-one -on -one clinic support as we uh, scrape by and as I uh, work on leading this while being a resident. Or with the right full-time employees, I think we could get 9x growth per year. I think this year we could get 500 clinics. And then the next year after that, once we really have things fleshed out, I think we could reach basically every developing clinic in the world. And we can make a serious assault on education and training gap with results to show. Right now we don't know exactly what the impact is. I have stories, I have what people tell me, and I have a little bit of data of what I see, but I think we can go much, much deeper. And I think if we can show the benefit and the impact of this work, which may be the most cost-efficient work that exists, maybe short of cancer screening, <laughs> um, I think we can win a lot more support. And I think we can expand our offerings to help rise and meet the new needs. And I imagine there's gonna be a time where AI is finally gonna click in and it's not gonna be a magical transition. I think we're gonna need training programs to help implement AI. Just for those that are very um, into technology. And when we do this, I'd say we should prioritize clinics that are at that critical phase in transition. They reached the 99 yard line and now they're trying to go for a touchdown, whether that's getting from 2D to 3D, 3D to IMRT, et cetera. 
We should prioritize clinics that are in vulnerable settings who have sufficient internet connection to make best use of this program right now. And we should focus on addressing systematic errors and concepts that will improve the care of every patient treated at their center. And we can measure and track performance. And I think we should use Prono. <laughs> so, um, great. Just, yeah, thank you so much. Great, Ben, that's the Ben event. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, Okay, do we want to put the full screen on so we can see everybody? Because there's a lot of people on. That was absolutely amazing. So big tickets from there is cloud-based collaboration is the new standard of care. I think it's, I think we mustn't forget in terms of the high income countries as well, because I think we should all be doing that. I think also for me, it was clear it's, the, it's in the young, isn't it? All this technology, we will engage our young people and that's where all our lateral thinking was coming. And also when we talked before about once you have that technology and, and assessing all that, you can then add on patient outcomes and then do your developmental studies, not waiting for randomized trials. You've got all this data, you could be developing technology as you go along their thing. So this was, that was amazing. So opening it up, my first question would be to industry, can you catch up with this? Can you respond to this? Because really, this is the way it's going to be. So what do we need to do to know it's there? It's about planning your system where you know that there's 5G and mobile phones around. What do industry think? Speak to somebody. Take yourselves off mute if you want to speak. I can't. I can't see everybody. There's so many people on at the moment. <laughs> I might just. I might just kick it off. This has yeah. been Nelm. <clears throat> All into well, you know, because I hate to say prono, 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 but I can say we built it to be universal. So all industry already works with Prono. Oh, yeah. No, I'm just thinking more in terms of our other technology building into it, our machines, our equipment. What what, what are we should, are we all thinking enough? And in, in terms of our processes and our teaching, are we all thinking the cloud's there? This is going to come because technology has been so fast, hasn't it? And COVID's making us get so far. So it's it's really in the response to that. Perhaps that's too big a question. What do, what do our clinicians on there? I see Louis and Mel on and lots of people. What what's Sorry, so I just, apologies, I didn't have the video on a bit earlier. I mean, I, I can definitely speak a little bit to that from an industry perspective. Thanks, Ben. Ben and I, we, we met in, in former lives and it was, it was a fantastic presentation. Um, and I think what I want to do is first commend, obviously, you know, Ben and his part and, and Prono, because the technology has really been one that has stimulated a lot of thought for, for years, right? And it's not, it's not today. Um, and then what I just wanted to add is that I think it's important that all of industry or, or it's important for the wider community to know and be aware and be comforted rather, let me use that word, in the fact that actually all of industry is working in this direction. Um, that you know, all of the different stakeholders and, and players in this space, and I don't wanna speak about anyone specific, I'm not going to speak specifically about Varian because I think this is not a uh, a point of promoting any individual company, but rather to inform those that are out there that all of industry are developing all types of platforms and capabilities that are cloud-based, that are native to cloud, that interact from the cloud directly to machines, as you mentioned, um, that are about aggregating data, about facilitating um, use of technology, not just in clinical use, but also as described in education and training. Um, so I, I think it's more just to, to reinforce the fact that absolutely we're all working on this space. Absolutely we're all fully supportive. We see it as the direction of travel. Uh, yeah. COVID has probably accelerated it more than yeah. anything else and brought it into light in terms yeah, of- I, I think that's right, because COVID has really, uh, really pushed this. Um, Lisa, can I just bring you in, in from the sort of the third world, yeah, so low and middle income. How how quick do you think they could respond? Is this can you see what barriers are there, or is this going to be great for advocating there? Perhaps Lisa's on mute still. 
Sorry, Pat, did you mean Lisa me? Yes, yes, sorry, okay. Lisa, me to you, yes, yes. Because <laughs> you were talking, to, um, speaking to the clinician, so again, because no, no, I'm not they, a clinician. They weren't responding we, to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we work at the Program of Action for Cancer Therapy. So again, from the International Atomic Energy Agency, I know we're looking at ways to deliver training and capacity building in a virtual way. And so I know, Ben, you were just mentioning at the end that you're using existing platforms. And so I would just point to the Human Health Campus. I don't know if there are any of my NAHU colleagues online, but they've built up a lot of these virtual training even before the pandemic but the um, activities are really well utilized now when people cannot travel for that in person. So I think it's, it's, a, it's great and definitely could be utilized. Thank you. Any other comments from people? Yeah, I'll just, uh, yes, the clinician. So, so I'll- uh, Good, thank you. Comment. <laughs> no, first of all, I, I, I really appreciated both of the presentations and um, was not personally uh, aware of, um, you know, either of the projects. And um, in some ways, you know, both of them are, are unique and, and um, interesting. And, you know, I intend to explore um, both of them in a little bit more detail to understand, you know, the idea of um, creating a, a, a cloud-based sort of universe for uh, radiation oncology, um, you know, I think makes a lot of sense to to develop resources globally to provide you know a standard of care um, is is going to be extremely hard to um, uh, is, is going to be extremely hard to stand up um, and uh, and and so the idea of of being able to plug into an AI or a cloud based uh, type of uh, decision support algorithm with, um, um, you know, all the tools that you need to provide care, I think is, is going to be great. I think, you know, the question is going to be, you know, access and as, as much as, you know, mm. it was alluded to, you know, we don't want to get into the vendor wars, you know, there is, let's just face it, competition between the vendors in terms of, you know, who's supporting what and, and having been involved in the, the iHero project, you know, for, for quite a long time, I think, you know, it's time to, um, you know, it's, 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 it's time for the vendors to um, sort of say, you know, neutral on this, you know, let's look for the greater good, um, you know, to some extent, because, you um, I do see that as potentially a, a, a limiting aspect, but I think in terms of Ben Lee's work um, and the idea of um, just enabling um, people around the world, I think is is you know is phenomenal. And you start plugging this into um, into a cloud-based system, and you know you're going to be able to provide you know standard of care and, and the, just the, the craziest of places. So. Um, so kudos to, to, to both you guys on, on these efforts. And uh, I'll probably be pinging you, you know, just to, to get some further information. The, uh, as an older generation person, you know, from, from Ben Lee's perspective, uh, I also have some faculty that have been involved in, uh, uh, in India and other places um, that, uh, that I'll be plugging you into. Yeah. No, Louis, that's a great contribution. Yeah, I think this has been really exciting. So I was thinking we're just going to go on to, to Birgit now and, and some strategy, but perhaps be thinking about and do feed in. Um, Birgit will tell us how in a minute, minute to think about where we need to be thinking in this space. What other people do we need to bring into the discussion? Perhaps thinking about data and outcome data, how to feed that in and what do we need? This is the time and space to be really thinking naturally now. Perhaps we need more younger people. I like this, our generation, Louis, I like that. Right, so fantastic. And so, Birgit, just for the last 10 minutes or so, um, you're just gonna update us on the strategy and some communication and where all this, how we're sort of building this through and how we can really make a contribution in radiotherapy now by being disruptive like this. Yeah, thank, thank you, Pat. And maybe before I, just from a flow perspective, since we were having a discussion, 
Um, you'll be, all of you will be receiving um, a message after this call to join our Slack group. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Slack, um, we're using it as a platform um, to be a forum for discussion. So um, you can, if you click on the link that you'll receive, you'll be joining the Global Coalition Slack group. And it's a very user-friendly way to, um, to interact and to, why can't I share my screen? Um, and to communicate. So this is replacing um, the forum that was on the website. And here's just, and this is what the home screen looks like for those of you who have never been um, on Slack, you'll receive instructions as to which teams you'd like to join. And again, this will be um, a way, whether you're on a mobile device, a phone, a tablet, or your laptop, for you to communicate with others. So if as an outcome of today's discussion, you wanted to send a message to Ben or Ben, um, this will be the forum to allow you to do that. Okay, so just so you know, that's gonna be coming. If for any reason you don't wanna join, just, uh, just don't click on the link. Okay, but that's the, um, the platform we're gonna be using since we just had a nice discussion. And I wanna say thank you also to um, both, both Ben's. I'm, I'm actually really moved by the work um, you've done. It's, uh, it's really incredible and touching, so thank you. All right, I'm gonna take the rest of the time and... Okay, let me start here. So I'm conscious of everybody's time. I'm going to walk you through. Um, so this is the Global Coalition. Um, many of you we've seen on a regular basis. So thank you for being part of this effort. And just wanna walk through where we are in, in terms of our uh, strategic plan. So we have uh, defined, and thanks to all of you who have been part of the contribution to our vision and mission and values. We've had a lot of very important input from many of you. So I wanna thank you ahead of time. And really, you know, what you heard today is, is a direct outcome of um, what the Global Coalition has been working on. Uh, which is a world where access to quality radiotherapy is universal and equitable. Our mission or purpose is to save a million lives each year by 2035 through worldwide understanding and proactive implementation of innovations and best practices in radiotherapy. And I want to highlight um, innovation and best practices. That's something we're focused on. Our values are innovation, agility, collaboration, and patient centricity. So we're putting in place our plans. And we have, um, we're working on structure right now. So there's uh, some additional work that's being done. Our core leadership team you see here. Um, so there are five of us. We have, um, these are the founders. We've, again, we've had input from many stakeholders which is really highly valued. Um, we're working with partners, organizations and individuals in country. We're putting in place an advisory board to provide governance and strategic input. And we're branching out to a community network. So um, many of you here today, these are individuals who form our growing community. Who we are and how we lead. So it's important really to, to talk about who we are. We're a global multidisciplinary innovative collaborative community of experts and stakeholders. And that's who you see here today. Um, we provide leadership uh, up, across, and down. So through policy shapers and policy leaders, creating really what we see as a global movement of access to radiotherapy. We're leading through the radiotherapy uh, professionals. So again, catalyzing innovations, whether it's through delivery, planning, automation, what you heard today, standardization, leveraging um, artificial intelligence and the digital revolution. So this is something we really want to harness and bring together in, in one hub. And leading across ca the cancer continuum. So although we, um, we want to make sure that, radio th that there's access to radiotherapy, quality radiotherapy for everyone, we realize that this needs to be done 
um, across the cancer continuum, um, all the disciplines, including prevention, screening, diagnostics, treatment modalities, and palliation. Very important that it's a that we have a global health perspective here. Um, as you see today, I mean, we have over 30 um, people joining and, and listening, and this has been the, the norm for all of the pretty much monthly webinars that we've had. Um, we have a global and growing reach, and you just see here a snapshot of the, the types of organizations encompassing industry, trade associations, um, radiation oncology, um, societies across the world. So from ESTRO to ASTRO to JASTRO, um, really across the globe, and we're really proud of that. So what have we achieved to date? Um, we were founded in April, 2020, so we're not even a, a year old. And initial focus um, was on the impact of COVID and that's now expanded to radiotherapy trends and innovations as part of cancer care as mentioned. Um, we had a launch with the Lancet Oncology, Oncology publication. And um, since then, as I just mentioned, we've had regular webinars with expert speakers on key topics, as you heard today. Um, we've conducted interviews with 20 global experts and stakeholders to really make sure that this global coalition has value and that we're complementing um, the other organizations that are working um, in, in other either functions or disciplines in the cancer space. And we have, um, as Pat said, and initially we've published and have communication, which you can see on our website. We have white papers. We have the presentations of all of the webinars that we've held to date. Um, we're working on uh, right now, finalizing a Red Journal editorial on the Global Coalition and, um, and really beginning to have momentum around acting as that, as that hub for anybody who is looking for expertise. So a snapshot of the objectives, um, three of them, catalyze for innovation, advocate for access, and lead collaboratively. Um, so I'm not gonna read everything here, but really we wanna make sure we bring innovations like the ones you just heard about to ensure that we're connecting all the global experts and stakeholders um, in this inclusive forum to hear and learn about what's new and what's, what's coming. Advocating for accelerated and widespread access. So this is ensuring that um, national and international cancer plans include radiotherapy, that reimbursement is considered, uh, that radiotherapy is published as really clinically critical clinically valid, economically justified, and patient-centric. And again, that we're leveraging what is clearly from a digital um, perspective, again, as you heard today, um, it's so powerful for radiation therapy to leverage that. We're a key discipline in that regard. And we're doing this by uh, leading and driving innovation collaboratively, again, across, um, across the entire cancer care continuum. So these are objectives. We're looking at um, a five-year time frame. Um, I'm, what we're linking with, we realize that the outcomes of our efforts are very aligned with what was published in 2015 in Lancet Oncology, which is really a seminal publication around the value of radiotherapy and um, very specific actions and targets that will help drive that access to radiotherapy. And what we're working on with um, certainly the, in fact, the authors of this publication who are supportive of the Global Coalition is to update these key actions and also to update the targets. Um, and we hope that by doing that, by focusing on our strategic objectives, that these outcomes can then be realized. Our audiences are located worldwide. So at the country level with public health officials and policy leaders, payers, ed education, um, patient advocacy groups. Again, I said earlier, but we're, we're crossing disciplines that impact cancer care. So from surgeons to medical oncologists, not only radiation oncologists, physicists, health economists, global health leaders, financiers, payers, digital telemed 
telemedicine and AI leaders. So we really want to make sure that we're touching anyone who can impact cancer care and spanning the entire continuum. So treatment modal, prevention, screening, diagnostics, treatment, palliation, education, et cetera. So we're looking at, and here we are partnering with the stakeholders in that cancer care continuum. And really catalyzing action through expert networks. Um, and you know, what you heard today is an example of something that's, uh, that is taking place. Certainly Global Coalition hasn't spearheaded that, but what we can do is we can bring experts like Ben and Ben to the Global Coalition to share what they have done with all of the other stakeholders that are on this call. And that's something where we feel we have expertise and that we can really serve as the hub um, for anything that touches radiation therapy and radiation oncology that people turn to us. We have an inclusive forum. We're increasing innovation and access through evidence-based education and communication, which is um, on our website. And we're going to be expanding how we communicate, driving advocacy through implementation tools and programs. We have a lot of experts as part of our core team and as part of industry that can help with some of these tools and programs. And we're partnering with key stakeholders, many of whom are here on the call, but also um, from a broader perspective, linking with pharma, linking with organizations um, who are here today, IAEA, um, WHO as well, um, and some of the larger groups that operate on a, in a global capacity, UICC, CCAN, et cetera. And so just to conclude, I mean, this is still some meat to be put on the bones here, but we're literally um, putting our strategy in place in a phased approach. We're not boiling the ocean overnight, but we really feel we have significant momentum. We're seeing, seen as adding high value, and we're going to continue to, to frame our approach, um, again, around providing access through innovation to quality radiotherapy for all. And that's, uh, that's what we're all about. So I will thank you there. Okay. That's a great presentation. Thank you so much. So I hope that gives everybody um, some ideas of where we're thinking we can take this global coalition. But to thank everybody, I know it's been a really difficult 10 months for everybody, but I think coming together, number one, it's been lovely meeting everybody and sharing all that experience. But I think now, please do feel free to feed into where we see this hub, where we see this global strategy going. And, and also to be thinking by uh, next week, as well, uh, next time as well, about what else we can do towards this white paper we'll do starting off with this digital revolution here. Any thoughts now from um, the everybody online, just we've got another minute comments on the strategy or where we are, or we're all thinking we're going in the right direction and let's get on with it. And this is our time, radiotherapy, this is it. <laughs> Um, hi, this is Isabel from Sigma. Hello. Hello, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I'm seeing people if you can share the slides. It was a great presentation. And then uh, from uh, Birgit, it would be good to share, I guess everything is still white paper, but um, just want to make sure that, you know, if whatever you take it, because I see there's partnerships mentions, and I just want to be cautious about, you know, partnership with WHO, IEA, Seek, and UICC, that I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something we need to, to formalize. To, to be just conscious that um, we yes. may, that we take yeah, that these aren't right these aren't formal partnerships. Yes, I agree. Which yeah. let's not say that we don't. We won't. We, we will. I just yeah, yeah. We don't have right. document. We don't have documented agreements in place. Let's yeah, put it that way. I think it's yeah. uh, it's important. Thank to you, Isabel. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Isabel. Good good uh, clarification. Great, so please everybody feed in. Ben's just put up his slides, which is good. There'll be a copy of this videoed um, on the website anyway, so you can go and see it again. And we must tell Australians, it's sort of three o'clock in the morning for them now. And so um, just to remain, thank everybody. Um, keep safe, hopefully the next month will go well for everybody. And then we'll meet back up again in another month um, and we'll take it to the next step. So thank you then.